Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm going to talk about the Easing spin and gauge models, so simulating these with Monte Carlo methods on hyperbolic lattices in two and three dimensions. And so this is work done with uh, my collaborators at Syracuse, um, Assad, Simon and Jay, and Royce. And so I'm going to primarily just be presenting results. First, I'm going to talk about gauge because this is the work in progress and it's maybe uh, the one that's more exciting to me, but it's also uh, quite incomplete. But uh, at least it's more fun to talk about. And then if, uh, you know, I can move on to the more boring one uh, later on, but there's, uh, you know, there's a paper on this one. So if I don't get through everything and I'm crunched for time, I, I can just burn through these. Uh, but this one I I'd like to talk about. Okay, so let's talk about C2 gauge here. I'll just sketch out the model here for you. Hopefully it's somewhat familiar. So this is a uh, gauge theory with little uh, Z2 fields and they live on the links of this lattice. Well, this lattice is a four, three, five lattice and I'm gonna, I'll show pictures of what this is so you can get a better idea. But this is a hyperbolic lattice. It's basically uh, made up of cubes, but instead of four, four cubes around an edge, there's five. Uh, cubes around each edge. And this gives it this uh, negative curvature. So the partition function for this model is here. You've got the easing spins and they're just, they live on the links around the plaquettes. So it's a square lattice, it's a cubic lattice still. And then you've got a coupling here that I denoted beta. And so this is a pretty uh, straightforward, normal partition function for Z2 gauge theory. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is the starting point. So this is what the lattice looks like. So uh, it's a cubic lattice, as I said, and so the, the spins are on these links and they interact uh, around a plaquette. And so here I've shown several layers of how this is built. So. Uh, there's like, for instance, you could start with a central cube and then you could put a cube around each one of those. And then you could put a cube around each one of those and so on and so forth. And you can just, uh, you can, if you try to follow, uh, you know, some cubes here. So these two are sandwiched inside here. And you'll notice there's one, two, three, four, five cubes around this edge. and uh, this is just built up recursively in this way. And this is what makes it a uh, hyperbolic. But other than your normal, you know, flat space cubic easing model, uh, I mean, easing gauge, it's the same model. I just, uh, we're just simulating it on this different lattice. Okay, here are some minor simulation details just uh, for people who, for the numerical scientists uh, who like to see this stuff. Um, you know, it's convenient to rewrite the action so that you basically have the spin you're interested in and then the surrounding staples of the plaquettes that share that. And we did the uh, simulation using the heat bath algorithm. And for the analysis of the data, we uh, binned the time series data to assess autocorrelations. And then after doing the binning we, for, for error estimation, we use the single elimination jackknife. And then whenever we do, whenever I show fits of the data, uh, they're correlated. Okay, so now I'm just gonna start getting into some of the results. And uh, I guess you guys can talk to me about them if you want. Uh, but otherwise I'm, I'm just gonna present the, where we're at in this study and how we understand it, uh, if at all. So here I'm plotting the average plaquette and the plaquette susceptibility only on the boundary. So, you know, the simulation, let me just, oops, it's later. Uh, you know, the simulation, all these, the, 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 the spins live on all these links and, you know, the simulation runs with all these links. But what I'm computing is, uh, just the average plaquette on the boundary plaquettes. Uh, 
and the, similarly just the susceptibility on the boundary. And so you can see here, it's a pretty uh, seemingly uh, boring average plaquette. It seems to rise pretty linearly just from zero and then plateaus at around one where it should. And the susceptibility, uh, also nothing remarkable. I, I mean, not unexpectedly, just because of the way this curve looks, but uh, you can see it's also not particularly interesting. And there's very little volume dependence. So I'm just showing one volume here at uh, or, you know, a reasonably large lattice. Uh, and there's basically no volume dependence in, in these two observables. Okay, so we don't have to look at uh, these quote unquote, uh, you know, this thermodynamic bulk quantities, even though that was on the boundary. Uh, we can look at on um, something else. So here uh, is the Wilson loop. And so the Wilson loop is this closed curve of fields. So uh, he, he, in this, this, in the Z2 gauge, it's simply the product of the Z2 fields around a closed loop. And so here you can imagine on this lattice, what you do is, you know, you, you construct some loop on the boundary. And then there's a corresponding minimal surface through the bulk and the corresponding surface on the boundary itself. And um, that relationship between the sort of interior minimal surface and the boundary surface we can use to understand some, some of the expected behavior. So here's another picture of, you know, an example of a Wilson loop. And so using the strong coupling expansion, you can find that uh, basically for each plaquette that will, so the, the leading order term will be a minimal surface that connects this boundary loop through the bulk. And it will go through the bulk because that is the least number of, uh, that's the least number of plaquettes you can get involved by diving uh, inside. And each time you activate one of these plaquettes on the inside, you get a factor of tanch. And so you can see just running through the bulk, uh, the Wilson loop is going to be exponential, uh, where uh, exponential in the area in the surface area in the bulk. But we can, uh, just to get an idea, we can use this continuum relation. So you would expect uh, in the ideal situation that the amount of area on the boundary here is exponentially larger than the amount of area in the bulk. And so that's what I've got here. I've got some factors of the curvature for, for dimensions, but the, basically, the, the important thing is that you can see that the amount of area in the bulk is logarithmic in the amount of area in the, on the boundary. And so if you uh, use this relation just to get an idea of what's happening, so I'm just going to put it right up here, you can see if, through some simple manipulations that the, the, uh, uh, looking at the boundary area that the Wilson loop is expected to have some sort of power law behavior. So I can show you what we've got so far. Uh, it's not, uh, it's not exactly power law. <laughs> so uh, here's a few examples for a couple of couplings. And what I found is that the actual best fits uh, still have an exponential component. Uh, so I, I fit with a form that's got a, a boundary area exponent and a power law. Uh, in the boundary area. And so another way to think about this is that not only is there this kind of continuum expected relationship, but then there's a piece that's proportional uh, between these two. At, at, at least, uh, you know, I've tried several fits, but this is the one that uh, I feel is the best right now. And so, um, but other than that, it's a good fit. I can tell you that, you know, the p values are, are completely reasonable. Um, and so this is you know, almost certainly an artifact of discretization and probably as we've been discussing them, um, uh, there's probably some, there's some discretization effects that I'd like to understand about the, um, the perimeter and the kinkiness. And that's uh, maybe I'm just, you know, wrapping this up here in some effective way, but 
I, I need to spend some time thinking about it, but uh, ideally it would be nice to isolate just this power law contribution as I work through this. Here's some other plots of it though. So uh, this is the Wilson loop. So I've, I've made a 12 by 12 loop on the boundary. And here now is a function of the coupling. And so you can see uh, there is some sharp transition from essentially zero uh, to non-zero, but this is uh, getting this location to settle down is difficult. So I'm, I'm not sure how unique this point actually is. Uh, so I, I, I'm still looking in, into this, trying to see if there's actually anything interesting uh, going on here. And then here's the Wilson loop uh, for several values of beta now as a function of area. So this is like the previous, but I just wanna show you the, beta, the coupling dependence. So as beta gets larger and larger, you can see this thing really uh, softens. It stops to fall. It stops falling so dramatically. But, but even for, you know, you, you get to really small betas and this thing is just dropping. Uh, extremely quickly. Okay, uh, so this is another uh, observable we can look at is this plaquette plaquette correlator. Um, and so this would, this can tell us about uh, the glue ball mass. And so again, uh, you can imagine you have two boundary plaquettes and you can think of how they're talking to each other. Well, they, uh, the easiest way for them to talk to each other is to create uh, a minimal tube through the bulk. And that, that's what requires the least number of plaquette excitations to make a valid configuration. And so uh, you can, and you can see maybe with your eyes that there's, you know, there's only a handful of cubes that actually are involved in this tunneling process, uh, this tube here, but um, you can see on the surface, there's tons and tons of plaquettes uh, on the boundary. And so again, basically for each plaquette in the tube, you get a factor of tanch, and you can see that it's clearly exponential through the bulk. So this is the bulk uh, distance. But then again, trying to use this continuum uh, relation to see the leading order or the you know, expected behavior, uh, by substitution, ideally there would be again some power law in the boundary distance between these two plaquettes. So here's some data. This is much more noisy, unfortunately, uh, and it's dominated by the very early distances. And so again, um, it seems that this exponential with the power law part uh, seems to do best, the best job of fitting. Although, you know, there's, it's pretty competitive <laughs> between just this, just this, and both together, as you can imagine. Uh, you know, the thing falls off extremely quickly. So again, I'm still trying to extract uh, a signal here a uh, power loss signal, is, uh, but that, that's still a work in progress. So, but I still wanna show you some of the data um, about how this uh, correlator is looking for, for a couple of couplings here. Okay, and then if you take the power from the previous fits uh, seriously and you uh, think, you know, <laughs> that's it, then you can plot them as a function of the coupling and see uh, what that looks like. And so the fits, you know, because of the extreme fall off, the, the speed that this thing falls off, you know, basically all the results over here are very hard to appreciate. Uh, but in this intermediate range, you get uh, pretty re uh, reasonable fits and the, um, the power stabilizes. And it's almost roughly constant for some range. And then again, as it really starts to, as the correlator gets flatter and flatter, the fits are, are a little rough again. But maybe, you know, if if you can take this seriously, maybe the maybe there is some sort of constant uh, power law behavior for a range of couplings. Okay, so 
at least on the 3D gauge part, there's the possibility for this zero string tension uh, up to these discretization effects that I believe are you know, causing this exponential behavior in the actual Wilson loop and the correlators as well. So there's evidence that you could maybe extract a massless glue ball on the boundary, but I got to figure out how to deal with the, these discretization effects that are still still causing these uh, this exponential dependence. Uh, on the quote unquote bulk quantities uh, on the boundary, there's basically, you know, when I compute these, whatever you want to call them, thermodynamics or, or thermodynamic quantities or, or whatever, they, there's very little volume dependence. Um, but they, they, it seem, they seem to uh, converge pr pretty rapidly. Okay. So, uh, anyone have anything they want to say before I start talking about the spin model? Uh, Judah, hi. Hi. How are you doing? I'm well. How are you? Good. Um, I in the uh, plaquette plaquette correlation function. Uh, shouldn't you have a disconnected diagram? There's no quantum number that, that distinguishes it from the vacuum. Um, I think I understand what you're saying, but uh, you're just saying there should be, you can have little cubes out here. No, I'm running, saying that, that when you have a correlation, but you have a correlation between two plaquettes, as you pull them apart, you should have a constant term. That's the disconnected diagram. Like if I look at your curves, oh, I see a constant term. I see the disconnected diagram. Um, I do subtract off the uh, the vacuum part. Oh, you you subtract off the vacuum. I subtract off this squared. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. Then then you've gotten rid of that. Okay. Yeah. All right, that's fine. So all right, so now you're trying to find the excited state, but that makes it very noisy because you do that subtraction, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, yes, that it's extremely noisy. <laughs> Yeah, okay, good. Anyway, I, now I understand. I was wondering uh, where they did that. Okay, well. Yeah, th this is the, just the connected piece. I tried okay. to, I didn't mention it, I'm sorry. Okay, fine, that's good. Um, I mean, the other, I mean, this is sort of obvious thing to say. Um, you have only a few layers and you've got a very, I think a pretty violent negative curvature on the edges, right? Yeah. So I would think that, you know, it's a pretty crude approximation to a smooth curvature. Yeah, yeah. Which is another way of saying discretization errors are pretty dramatic. Yeah. I, I mean, to be honest, I'm surprised you get as much as you do. <laughs> so, so that's very nice. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you can see how that's because I think I mean you have five cubes around a point. That's kind of a pretty violent negative curvature, right? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think the it, it's yeah the first few steps in both of these are dangerous yeah, and yeah. it's all it's also the play it's also where almost all the curvature is coming into the fit so i have to uh i have to spend some time still working on this anyway it looks it looks amazingly good as a matter of fact it's always surprising so anyway thanks thanks a lot thank you right so could i ask quickly uh in uh, could you do you hear me i do hear you yeah, so uh, did you try for other lattices? How much do this alpha zero and alpha one depend on the choice of the lattice in case you tried that? Um, I have not. Um, I mean, in the two dimensional study that I'm gonna talk about soon, we tried several lattices, but in this 3D one, I've only worked on this uh, cubic lattice. Okay, okay. And in it, this it, case, it's, uh, sorry. It's a, yeah, I mean, it's a natural and a good idea what you suggest. and. Uh, I just need to find the time to do it. <laughs> okay, maybe wait for the second part. Thanks. So now this is uh, published work. Uh, so, like I said, if when the organizers let me know there's five minutes or whatever, I'll I might have to burn through some of this, but. Uh, you can find all these results in, in our paper. Okay, so this now is in two dimensions. And so this is the spin model. So the 
the fields are located on the vertices of this uh, three seven lattice. And um, this is, these are triangles and there's seven of them around each vertex as opposed to six, which would be a normal flat situation. And again, it's a very vanilla partition function. It's, it's the Yixing model. So uh, you have this nearest neighbor interaction between the Z2 fields. There's a coupling, usually thought of as one over this statistical temperature. And then um, it's a nearest neighbor interaction. So let me show these results from, these are just calculations of boundary observables. Now, uh, we do the simulation over the entire lattice. So the spins sit everywhere, even in the bulk and on the boundary. And just for uh, the sake of intuition, I, I present uh, here kind of a pedagogical walkthrough using the high temperature expansion to visualize uh, so, so, some of the, uh, you can visualize uh, the correlation functions and uh, the correlations between uh, the boundary spins may, may be easier. So when you do this high temperature expansion for the ESIN model, you basically get uh, an expansion over closed intersecting loops that are weighted by uh, this factor of tanch beta. And so for each, you know, for each bond uh, in the for each link involved in your loops, you get this factor of tanch, and then you sum over all possible. Uh, diagrams that you could construct where these are closed. So here's just an example of these little bubbles. Uh, on, and this is the three seven lattice uh, in the Poincaré disk. Uh, and for the spin spin cor correlator, you can still do this high temperature expansion. And what you uh, get instead when you place a source and a sink spin uh, is you get connected paths between the source and sink with uh, little disconnected pieces that we were just talking about that kind of float around out, uh, you know, little bubbles that float around out in space. Uh, and then this connected path between the, your, you know, your source and sink spins, the correlation function. And so now you can imagine you have a, a two boundary spins and you want to look at the two point correlation function between them. And uh, like before, basically for each, it's clearly shorter to pass through the bulk. So, you know, you count the number of edges here involved uh, connecting these two spins and you know, there's 10 or something. And then on the boundary, it's uh, outlandish. And so it's a much it's a much better, you know, it's a much safer route <laughs> to travel through the bulk. And you can see then that that contribution would be exponential. So the, the leading order behavior for this correlation function uh, is exponential to the bulk. And we can do the same thing as we did before. Did anything change? Can you guys still see the presentation? Yes, we can see. Okay, my computer just told me something odd. Okay, fine. So um, now again, you can you can uh, there's an expected exponential relationship uh, it, between the number of edges, uh, the distance here through the bulk, and the distance along the boundary. And so this bulk distance uh, is logarithmically related to the boundary distance like this. And then using this in the bulk correlation function, you can get an idea of this leading order behavior uh, on the boundary, which is a uh, power law where this is uh, the power. It involves the coupling, the radius of curvature and, and some prefactor. And so you would expect roughly this behavior. And so let's try to uh, fit this and see what we get. And so now here, um, uh, so there's a, a, a 
a few temperatures here. And this is this is in a, a different set of variables. It's not on the it's not actually in terms of the boundary distance per se, but um, it's just the angular distance around uh, the the boundary. It's okay. It 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 doesn't it doesn't it, it doesn't matter much. I mean, it matters, but it's it's roughly the distance. So um, this is the correlation function, and we fit to an onset. So now we do have the uh, disconnected part included in the fit. So we have an overall Today constant. Have five more minutes. Thank you. So we have an overall constant shift, and then um, a prefactor, this angular distance around the boundary, and then the power law. And we find uh, pretty good agreements. You can see the chi-squareds are pretty reasonable, and the p-values are, are, are pretty good. And so for a range of betas, it appears that the uh, two-point function from between boundary spins is uh, you know, consistent with the power law. We can also look at uh, the boundary observables. So this would just be computed with the spins, the you know bulk observables, quote unquote, computed with the boundary spins only. And so we can look at like the absolute magnetization or the energy, and then the fluctuations of these two quantities. And these are just uh, you know in, in how you'd expect them to be. So the sum over the spins. Uh, this one, I mean, we call, this is a sort of a misnomer, uh, but it's actually, you know, it's this interaction. It's the, <laughs> it's the nearest neighbor product between spins. Calling it the energy might not be the right thing to say, but it's it's this observable. So the product of nearest neighbor spins along the boundary, and then the fluctuations in the magnetization in, in, in this quantity. And so here uh, is the magnetization as a function of the temperature. And here's the magnetic susceptibility as a function of the temperature. And this is these are the number of sites. So th this is the size of the boundary uh, as the lattice grow grows larger and larger. And so we can see that at least for this range of volumes, the magnetization, you know, it might be sharpening, but it's not sharpening particularly quickly. And at least at these volumes, it does not appear to be changing. Uh, you know, spontaneously. Um, the susceptibility also does appear to be growing, but um, it's growing very small and it's not a very large, but, uh, you know, it's incrementing consistently each time. Uh, it's also very symmetric. So if you look at the maybe the largest two volumes, uh, it's not getting sh uh, sharper. So it doesn't seem to be narrowing much either. Uh, it, it seems to be a whole wide range that's actually uh, growing uh, consistently larger and larger. And so we suspect there's something going on here, uh, but we, we don't have anything conclusive. But we can look at, um, for instance, the scaling of the susceptibility as a function. So you know we can look for power law behavior in the scaling of the peak of the susceptibility. And so here, uh, for one temperature, so this is, uh, sorry, so this is not the peak. This is for a, a few temperatures. Um, and so this is the log of the number of boundaries. So this is like log of the volume versus log of the susceptibility at that temperature value. And we find, uh, we find a reasonable fit for power law divergence, where this is the power. At a, a little hotter temperature, it's also a fairly you know, sensible uh, fit valve, you know, fit quality, also diverging. Um, and this is kind of at the peak. Uh, I think three is basically at the top here. And then even higher temperature, um, you know, to the eye, it's seemingly a good fit, but uh, to the computer, it's not great. Uh, but there's roughly, <laughs> roughly uh, power law growth here. Uh, on either side. And these are somewhat symmetric uh, values about the peak value. And moreover, uh, you can relate the divergence of this susceptibility. So the, the exponent that the susceptibility is diverging uh, to the two-point correlation function. So this uh, susceptibility is the integral of the two-point correlation function. 
And so by noticing that, if you put in the expected behavior, so this power law behavior for the two-point correlation function, and you do the integration, uh, the, the scaling of the susceptibility, so the exponent of, this, of the scaling is related to this delta, which was the power involved in the two-point correlation function. Uh, and so that's here. So the susceptibility uh, uh, divergence and the power law are seemingly related this way, at least approximately. And when we compare them, so if we, using that relation, if we take the actual power law that we um, calculate from fitting the correlation function, and we take the exponent from the diverging susceptibility and you know rescale it uh, to make it equal to supposedly equal to this delta, we find a uh, pretty good agreement between the, the power law and the susceptibility. So those, this is a uh, nice evidence that at least the, the fits are uh, consistent with the susceptibility on the boundary as well. So then, yeah, I'm gonna skip everything and I just, I'll just show my conclusion. So some dual lattice stuff here, which is interesting, but. So um, yeah, it, uh, for the spins, for the Easing spin system, we find two-point correlation functions that are consistent with power law behavior. And uh, th these power law correlations would support the idea of conformal field theory living on the boundary. And ultimately, uh, it seems that this power law behavior is really related to this exponential growth in the amount of space uh, on the boundary as you move out from the bulk. And it appears there's uh, perhaps some sort of phase transition on the boundary, uh, but uh, we're not sure what universality class it lies in, and uh, it, it needs to be analyzed a bit more. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Suda. Time for questions? Yeah, Rich. This, this relationship that you have between delta and gamma nu, that, that should only be there at a critical point, right? So the fact that it, it, it occurs off of the peak uh -huh. indicates to me maybe it's just mean field theory or something. There's really no critical point, right? Is yeah, I mean, uh, maybe we, I mean, we, uh, our argument was not that. Instead, we thought that there might be a line of critical points. Well, that, that's what I'm saying. It, it looks like it's critical uh, everywhere. Because isn't that right? That relationship you wrote down between delta and gamma nu is a, is a critical relation of scaling, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, wherever, yes, wherever this. Right. Holds, so the fact that yes. you see it fitting over a whole range suggests that you have a line of critical points, not a critical point. Yes, right. I agree. Okay, okay good. Yes. OK, more questions? Seems like there are no more questions, so let's uh, thank Judah again. Sorry. Uh, oh, OK. Anosh, may please. I? Uh, yeah, yeah, please, time? please. Do you have time? Please yeah. go ahead. Yeah, please go uh, ahead. What is the dependence on the number of boundary points in this 2D and 3D case? Uh, we didn't have time to talk about it, I suppose. Um, and the dependence on the lattice that you mentioned. Oh yeah, the dependence on the lattice. Oh man. Um, so when we calculate uh, here, so I don't, I don't have the table on me, but okay. So we can we can uh, we can try to extract these the radii of curvature from. Okay, I have to recalibrate here. So we, we've in done the, fits. In the three seven lattice, it's a fraction of the total number of points. I think it's a golden ratio. That's right. You know, it's, it's a fixed number. Um, maybe I say, we have also done these lattices but in a different geometry. It would be interesting. We have the three dimensional lattice in the cylinder geometry. And I think, this is a question, I think that 
we should get the same results as a coordinate transformation of your results. That sounds totally reasonable. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, now you're way ahead of us because we not managed to get there. So <laughs> who knows? Maybe you can come help us get there. <laughs> but so by cylindrical there. geometry, by cylindrical geometry, do you mean that the uh, cross sections are hyperbolic and you have uh, regular Euclidean in the in the Z direction? We have a lattice in which we have a, um, a cylinder, which is another possible. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. We have a lattice which is um, is got this hyperbolic disk. So we actually have the triangulated one that you showed first. So we have a plane. Yeah, we have this kind of uh, triangulated lattice uh, across slices, and yes. then uh, then it's a cylinder going down. It's not a direct. Yes. It's it's the um, Global ADS, if you like, and yeah, uh, yeah, I understood. I understood. And and so you know, but um, that's supposed to be a coordinate transformation to go right. from the ball to the to the cylinder, right. and therefore you would think that we could do a coordinate transformation on our correlation functions and get the same thing. That's of course not obvious that it work in this discrete form, <laughs> but it does give two ways to look at the same problem. Right. But I say we haven't gotten anywhere near this kind of simulation. I need another student or another person. Anyone who want to volunteer? We got the codes writ written. We can uh, hand them to you. Okay. Uh, maybe one more question. One last question. Oh, I don't see any. So let's uh, thank Judah. So with that, we are coming to the concluding part of the program. So David Sheik uh, will give the concluding remarks. That I will, yeah. I know she asked me to give some concluding remarks and I'll try to keep these relatively brief and just maybe start off by saying uh, the personal uh, reflection or impression. I, I always like coming to these sorts of meetings as someone firmly rooted in lattice field theory, this is really the best opportunity there is for me to get beyond that, that domain and encounter things like stringy holography and all of the gravitational side of, of the work that uh, I'm connected in and involved with that I wouldn't otherwise encounter. So I hope that all the rest of you are feeling similarly, those of you based on the gravitational side have enjoyed learning a bit about lattice field theory and lattice supersymmetry um, and all the other lectures we have. So I want to, you know, on the basis of that general reflection, want to thank all of the speakers we've had, the lecturers, the research talks, um, both those who have been able to come here in person as well as those who have had to join us online, even though it's disappointing not to be able to, to chat with the online speakers in the tea breaks and the dinners and the evenings, it is also, I think, a uh, positive outcome of what we've had to go through over the past two years that we've developed this capability for people to participate even when they haven't been able to make it here uh, to India in person. And um, also acknowledge that many of those who are participating are doing so at somewhat awkward times very early in the morning or late at night. I think for Judah right now, it's rather early and for Anne at the start, she was uh, giving us lectures on lattice field theory around midnight in Colorado. I also want to thank all of you in the audience, even those who weren't presenting, again, both in person and on Zoom, we've had lots of great questions coming in on all the presentations, which have, has helped to make this program more dynamic, more insightful and more informative. Uh, to all of us and that takes me to really thanking the people who have made this all possible maybe starting with Anosh as the uh, the driving force behind the organization and extending from Anosh to okay well okay Anosh and then everyone else, but specifically um, giving acknowledgments to all the staff here at ICTS who have helped to 
make everything run smoothly from the cafeteria to the guest house, all of the audiovisual techs who have got everything set up streaming remotely connected and uh, and running and keeping the microphones in good supply and especially mentioning Gayatri in the program office, who I suspect all of us have had a lot of communication with to get the logistics uh, in place. So let's thank those folks. And as a final closing remark on the closing remarks, uh, I was reminded attending this program that this is actually the second time we've had these numerical holography workshops here at ICTS in Bangalore, but it's actually the sixth in the overall series that goes back to 2009 in Imperial College London, followed by workshops in, in Santa Barbara, in Kyoto, and in Edinburgh, as well as the first round in Bangalore. And I suspect this will not be the final uh, entry in this series of workshops, so I invite you to Think about where, where and when you might uh, next like to have this sort of encounter between the string theory holography and lattice field theory, numerical conformal bootstrap, all of these communities getting together. You are, of course, all warmly invited to the uh, Lattice 2024 conference in Liverpool in two years. And we can think about whether to have future installments of this workshop series there or somewhere else in the years to come. So thanks again for coming and sticking with me to the end of the closing remarks. And thanks again to everyone who's helped to make this possible. And also thanks to Dave, uh, who uh, also did a lot of work and is, didn't thank himself. <laughs>